talk to us, my brother, about consciousness. What is consciousness? Well, consciousness itself, you know, from, 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 it's not, neurologists really don't understand what consciousness is because the human brain really hasn't been mapped out. They understand how the brain works from having medulla amagata, cerebral cortex, cerebellum, um, how dendrites and synapse work, you know, uh, hippocampus and all those different parts of the brain that makes up the brain. But when it comes to consciousness, they really don't know if it's going on within the brain as a result of neuroactivity or, or in, a, in a sense of um, it happens after or if it exists prior. So consciousness is not nothing that a neurologist or not even an um, evolutionary psychologist can really tell you how it functions because they don't really understand the true total functioning behavior of the brain. So consciousness itself, from what I study, if you go back, back all the way down to quantum particles or quantum physics, we have to deal with space-time geometry or energy that exists at Planck scale. And when you deal with space-time geometry or energy that exists at Planck scale, consciousness only means awareness. It's not in the sense of the cognitive functioning behavior of the brain, the way it, it functions right now, like I'm talking, I'm communicating. It's not like that. Consciousness just has a sense of awareness of itself. Awareness of, of 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 the sense of existence, existence itself, and one of the mythologies of Kemet, one of the secret names of Ra was Amen Renef, meaning his name is hidden. And he he came to Aset, asking her, her and telling her about all the things that he was. And Aset said, No, 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 you're none of this. I know your secret name, and his secret name was Amen Renef, meaning his name is hidden. But that in itself is consciousness because it's a sense of awareness that only it knows amongst itself. Not in the sense of human comprehension like, yeah, I'm this, I'm that. That's the ego. But awareness within something that exists at Planck scale that we really can't comprehend at that state. So you can call it something like a field. A field that's all around us or a satellite that our brains, which is which is a natural sponge, absorbs or collect. This is like if somebody was to choke me and, 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 and I wasn't getting enough oxygen to the brain. What do I lose? I lose consciousness. So does consciousness exist in the brain or is it something that's going on all around and it keeps us going through, you know, it keeps us going and, and, and as in function as long as we have adenosine triphosphate, which is responsible for a lot of the energy transference inside of the body or the cellular structure through mitochondria. You get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. The yeah, conscious community is just people that has awareness, awareness of who they are, you know, a sense of black pride, of understanding something about blackness being important. You know, if you want to call it that, like um, you have brothers in the nation of Islam. Uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the stepping stone of the pyramid to allow us to go further in this. Noble Jali too. These were the gateways to understand the importance of blackness. That's the sense of consciousness. He had a conscious awareness, or he had an awareness of how important black is. You know, saying that the the original man was the Asiatic black man. Now we can throw the term Asiatic out from a five percent five percent perspective. Asia means mind, Attic means body. But on a literal perspective, we know that we know that what he was saying was that the original human being was a dark-skinned person. We understand that now. So that was the stepping stone to awareness. He had a sense of awareness. So conscious community only means the community of, of people that have a, have awareness of, of self, regardless of whatever costume they want to use. What I mean by costume is if it's ancient Kemet, if it's Hebrew or whatever. Those are costumes. But at the end of the day, we all say that the first humans were dark-skinned people. So that's the important. The average African-American don't know that. They don't even care about that. So when you have a sense of conscious community, we're talking about a community of people that's aware of this. Now, certain people got different methods that's unscientific that they use, staying in Bibles and mythologies and all that, if they choose to deal with that, but they do have the awareness that black is important, or whatever, we, if you want to call it black. Being that I'm an original man as a black man. A Hebrew would say that. A comedic person would say that. A Moor won't say that, but they'll say, you know, they like to say a, a dark complected or, a, you know, different dark complexion or what we were scientific scientists call yule melanin, which is dark pigment. They'll say that, you know, the original man was a darker skinned person. So they have awareness of that, you know. So conscious community has nothing to do with something spooky and quack or wacko, you know, that, that some people think that we're talking about. You know, they're part of the conscious community. Right, I agree. Um, why do you think the Moors don't like the term black? Because the white man said black is bad and black is evil. When we know that black is really power, black is the essence, black is the energy. Why are they so afraid to use the word black? Because they're basing it off the Western, westernized, Eurocentric um, uh, paradigm of what they say black is, meaning the lack of, a void, or dead, 
you know, back then even, you know, white was important to the indigenous dark-skinned people. Obatala in Yoruba means the chief of the white cloth, which meant purity, or the white crown and, and Kemet, which represents purity. So pink people with the mutation SLC 2485 or 4582 took on these titles and in the 17th century, this is when they start creating these, these slogans, I'm white and this, I'm this, and created the first um, unified banner of European races, white supremacy. You know, at one time, Irish wasn't even classified as white, or certain Jews when they came over here. They had to go through different approvals to be classified as that. It was a status. But um, they don't like to use it because how Europeans perverted and destroyed the the, 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 the the word of black. But black is powerful, if they understand how powerful it is. You know, the darker things is, the more unknown it is. It can't be seen in science. Lack of light, meaning it can't be seen. If we understood the speed of darkness, not just the speed of light based off metrics per second, we understand how, how powerful black really is because it can't be seen. But like at nighttime, when you see space, that's really nothing but a reflection or the shadow of the earth. You can look this up. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, 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 so that's the shadow of the earth. So, blackness is very important. We have to also understand that Noble Jali got a lot of his information from just not the dude who created the Lost Aquarian Gospels. I mean, I classify myself as a Moor, and to me, word the word Moor means black. I mean, you're a Moor. Nigeria, anybody can be Moor. That's how I look at it. But Noble Jali dealt with his Moorish science because he was dealing with, you know, the Byzantine. I mean, not the Byzantine, but the Ottoman Empire, the Turks at this time period, even the, the Fez Wan thing. And a lot of the Asiatics in the Middle East, he remember Noble Jali said that we are, uh, we're not black, Negro, we're the colored. And he talked about the original man coming in Africa being olive complexion. Olive complexion is intermediate brown. It was people with the skin of a, with a yellowish underhue, a greenish underhue, that olive complexion, intermediate brown. This is what French Montana the rapper is, or certain people that you see in, 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 in uh, North Africa. This is Olive. He, he believed that. And he didn't want to use the term black, negro, or the color because he's basing it off what Europeans like the term negro in, in, in Portuguese meant. It meant black object. And then it, and then it becomes West and the British nigger. And then it urbanizes into this thing that we say is nigger. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So they're basing it off that. Well, um, I interviewed the Moors this weekend. And mm -hmm. they said that black does not mean more. We got it confused. Mm, that's not true because if we look at the term Moor, the first people that was classified as Moors by the Greeks were a Berber tribe in North Africa in the Mediterranean. The term was Moros, and the term meant scorched because they had darker hue. Oh, <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Yes. Moros, and that's just what they they labeled these Berbers or these Amazigh speaking tribes in the northern Mediterranean because of their darker hue, and it meant scorched. No different than the term Ethiopian, which meant burnt skin. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's the same thing. Now, if you want to talk about Twanti Moors, olive complected Mediterranean Berber types, they were there too, the Twanti Moors. But, you know, this is when the term Moor, they want to get into this term called Western from Amorite. But Amorites were Arabian looking people from the Middle East. This is the earliest cloud of Arabians before they was called Arabians, just like the Akkadians. That's not you. Right. Okay, now we, um, we all know that our brother, Professor Larry, because you used the word, you said nigga. A lot of people are still hung up on the word nigger. They, they ride in the fence with the word nigger. They say, well, nigger means not God, God, king, or serpent, or snake. Go in just for a little minute on the word nigger, and then we move forward to that. We're going to just touch on that and keep it moving. Well, from the herbal perspective, urbanized term nigger is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a rejected version of the term nigger from the British into the perversion of the Portuguese word negro. And Brother Larry is right. You know, it doesn't have the same content as the Ethiopian Coptic Giz word niggas. It doesn't, it's not, it's not the same thing. We just urbanized something that made it cool. But when we've seen recently, through New Age or today's time, when we've seen the term niggas in Ethiopia, now we want to dilute it into that. And you can, because you can play with words. But in the original meaning, when we first started using the term nigger, it was just something that was just, just something that was a, a, a branch off of the term nigger that we was called. And we just ran with it. Now, since we look at the term Negos and we're getting more knowledge of self, understanding the different countries in Africa, now we want to say it means serpent king and this and that. From an Ethiopian perspective, it does. But Negos, we have to understand Amharic or the Tigray language. If you understand, like if you look at the Zana stone, you see it was written and translated in Giz and, 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 Giz and also um, Greek and Sabian. 
And if you study the Giz language of the Tigray, it's a it's an offshoot of Indo-European Greek, and it's also uh, have influence with um, Indian Indian Sanskrit because the Ethiopians control ports over there from the Aksumite Empire. So it doesn't mean the same thing as um as the Ethiopian term. We're just we're just making it that today. That's all. Okay, brother. Um, why do why do our brother Unk always use the term atheist, black atheist? Is the word atheist from the Greek? And if so, why would Unk be using the word atheist? Well, the term atheist is from Greek. A means no, theos means deity. Atheos, which means deity, is Greek. And the term, the reason why Unk used the word, because when he did the research on atheists, the atheists of um, Ionia and the different um, Greek type, they were anti-Greek gods. They didn't believe in the, in the Greek gods. They didn't believe in Zeus and in that. They felt that it was mythical. So he used the term as endearment against the monotheistic Abrahamic um, faith, which is, you know, Abraham, Judaism, Christianity, and um, Islam. He don't believe in that. And this is what the Greek, the original atheists were. They were Greek or Mediterranean white boys who had something against the Greek gods around them. They were anti-theos, which means deity. No deity. Uh -huh. okay. So yes, this is, and so this is their description of going against the Greek deities. And a lot of them were like um, Pythagoras and different important Greeks, um, Pythagoras and um, Plato. These different Greeks that were, were very um, influenced by the Nile Valley. And like, if, for example, if I came to Egypt 3,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, probably before a Greek, and I asked them, who is Theos or who is God? It didn't exist. We didn't have a God or a Theos. We had inter, interu or different concepts for a sense of power, power which is instrument beti which we translate as Pharaoh, you know. Um, even in Israel or the ancient Middle East, the El means strong or strength is not the same thing as God, which means to invoke or call on. So these, so to be honest with you, back then, the ancient people of the Middle East or the ancient people of Northeast Africa or the continent that we know as Africa, they had no idea of the Theos or God until Greeks came in and translated things the way they wanted to be. And you can see them doing that, you know, everywhere. They did it in India. They had a Buddhist period in India where they went there and reconstructed the Buddhist period. They did it with the um, Septuagint. And when they translated the Hebrew things into their own biblical scriptures or whatever, they did it with the uh, ancient Egyptians in Alexandria. You know, when they turned Jehuti or Tut into Thoth and Thoth into Hermes, you know, they, 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 they translated everything that was based off them. So these other Greeks are like, fuck y'all, we anti theos You know what I'm saying? And they studied the older formulas that people had prior before them. Mm, powerful. Powerful lesson. Once again, y'all, we speaking with our brother Angoldi. And Angoldi is a, um, he already done ran down his credentials. So we know that he is well qualified to deal with these topics and issues at hand. The term God, what is God? Where did God come from? And our people, we are afraid of God. We talk about God, we are afraid of God. Where did that term come from? Why did it exist on the planet today, brother? Well, oh, to invoke. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Say that, say that one more time. I said the term God is Indo-European, and it comes from the word God. It means to invoke or to call on. This term is not your description of the underlying principle of nature. This comes from a group of Indo-European, Germanic Indo-European speaking people of, of Western Europe. In Sanskrit, the term God means done, meaning a done. You feel what I'm saying? Right. So it has nothing to do with, with, with you. Now, the idea of God that we're dealing with today is an idea. It's not protein-based. It comes out of protein-based species, which is organisms. This is their description of an underlying principle you know, that sustains life. We create myths to make sense out of life. This is what we did. You know, we created the idea of God. Well, not us, but they, they did in, in, in certain parts of the area that they were in out of fear. So they created something outside of nature, something that's distant. So if you, that's why when you deal with Abrahamic faith, he exists outside of time and space instead of within time and space. Now, in Kemet, Ra forms himself within time and space. And prior before that, we get with Planck scale, space-time geometry. When you deal with the Ogdog of Kemet. Um, Nun Nunet, which is formlessness, Kun Kuket, which is darkness, Kun Huhet, which is boundlessness, Amun and Amunet, which is potential energy at rest. Now, Kun Huhet, which is boundlessness, is the beginning stage of the photon. Photon is not bound by time because it's not bound by mass. So it's boundless. And it's pockets of energy that carry light and, and energy. 
and it influences the electron, which forms the first stage of currency or movement. So what I'm saying is that when you deal with this, this thing of God, it's not you. It's not you at all. This is their description of power. And it doesn't mean the same thing that you hear because we understood the forces, the forces, the same way that scientists understand the forces of the day. You know, gravitational nuclear force, weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force, and electromagnetic nuclear force. You know what I'm saying? They understand those forces, and we had the same thing. But we put them in the phases of Nekru or Orishas. You get what I'm saying? Yes. Or Kulu Kulu. This is the same thing. Not God. God has nothing to do with you. This is the European description of power. This is his ancestor. God is a European ancestor. It means to call on or to invoke. Let's get into the word and get into the linguistics and see its origin. This is his ancestor. He called on God, not you. Mm. So um, why today they have associated God with religion, even with spirituality, brother? Talk about that. Because we live in an Indo-European speaking society where they mix up, again, we speak an Indo-European language. English is an Indo-European language. It comes from the Germanic languages. It's part of the Indo-European family. So everything that we say is based off what they do. God, religion, theology. You know, the, the ology means study of theos, meaning God, study of theos, which is the Greek. Go back to the Greek, theos. So we are speaking an Indo-European language, and their form of, the, of, of higher power is God. You know, the best thing that we can say in our community is most high or higher power, which represents the upper force, which is forces of energy that we know that's more, more greater than us. It is. You know, you deal with the four forces of, of, of nature that I just named, weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force, gravitational and electromagnetic. That shit is powerful. And, it's, and it's, it has a higher volume of energy than you. But you come out of that. But with these people, their form of power, you know, they, they put it all together. And they put this God thing in it, which is really a figment of, of Europeans' imagination. So we're calling on the ancestor when we call on God. And when we mix it up with spirituality, it totally con con destroys it. it. It pollutes it. Because this is not your methodology. We understood the rhythms of the universe. Um, the Kabbalion says, and I don't really like to deal with the Kabbalion. The Kabbalion is a, is a perversion of hermetic corpus, which comes from the comedic word Kabia, which means dice, Kibia. And that book was translated by a dude named Rama Sharaka, whose real name was Walker, William Walker Atkinson, who dealt with a lot of those theosophical bullshit that they were stealing from, you know, Greek schools and later on. But the Kabia, you deal with polarity, vibration, and cause and effect, gender, and the different vibrations. Africans, you can see this in our dance that we understood the rhythms and the vibrations of how the universe works. We work with hand in hand. You know what I'm saying? Hand in hand. We understood it. You're connected to the universe atomically, you're connected to the earth chemically, and we're connected to one another biologically. And when you can break that down, you can see why the Africans do what they did. Right, right. Well, the earth was formed as about 4.6 big, you know, 3.8. Well, they go, they go back to 4.2 4, 4, 4, to 3.8. It was a collision of giant shaped clouds of material that formed until, you know, the sun had collapsed and gravitation slowly gathered the gas together into clumps of, uh, of, of asteroids and small earlier planets. They call it testimonies. And then when you deal with that, these objects collided repeatedly and gradually and form into bigger, large gases. And then later on, it forms into the structures of the Earth that you see today. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it, 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 was a, it was a long process that ranged between 3.8 billion to 2 billion years ago. And then the core of it that left behind, like, you know, um, um, the Earth core that was hot and rock, that had formed a liquid and created the surface of the Earth. You get what I'm saying? Right. So it's, it's the leftover residue of gas clouds that formed our planet Earth. You know what I'm saying? Gravity pulling things together and holding it down. Some people like to equate that process of the building blocks of the Earth with God, you know, or consciousness. But, you know, it is what it is. Again, I don't want to say God because that's Indo-European and I don't want to call him his ancestor. Right. We can refer to that as the upper force or nature, as our ancestors said, which is nature. Nature doing it itself. Well, you know, the um, the Hebrew cats, they say the earth is only, they say we'll give them 20,000 years the most. That's how old it is. Well, well we got rocks that's older than 20,000 years. When you, deal with, when you deal with uranium lead or you deal with samarium um, neodymium, neodym, you can see, or potassium argon on the planet, you can clearly see that there's... Um, rocks or certain um, things on the planet that predates 20,000 years. Right. That's kind of insane. And, and trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and trees as well. Trees, yeah. 
That's what. That's why the importance of um, carbon dating, measuring carbon fourteen that transmits into carbon twelve, or how they escape or decay, is very important. But there's different ways to do that method. You get what I'm saying? Right. Different ways. So you deal with the chlorine thirty six intent, or you deal with you know uh, the fission track, or different things the way they deal with it. If you can clearly see based off the erosion of just dealing with thermal energy, which is heat erosion of rocks, you can clearly see that it, there's objects on the planet that predates twenty thousand years. That's kind of insane. I mean, the atomic structure in those brothers' bodies go back 14.2 billion years. Biologically, as a species, they go back 200,000 years. And the chemical components that form them can go back 3.8 billion years. And you can just look at the deoxyribonucleic acid or the four nucleotides of DNA, which is guanine, cytosine, and thymine, and see the measurement of that. The further you go back in DNA, the more closer you see you are related to different things on the planet. The further you go back. And it tells you that in the numbers. You don't know what the, he, the sun is made of, of different components. It's hydrogen at 70%, helium at 28, uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And then you got 0 0.5, which is neon and iron and, and magnetism and sulfur. That's 0 0.5. But when you're dealing with the sun, it's responsible for how organisms grow. Plants get, you know, plants and tree life get photosynthesis from it. Without the sun, we don't exist. You get what I'm saying? Yes, they, might throw the, they might throw the trick. And they're talking about, well, the sun is things that don't see the sun, but it still feels the pressure of what the sun gives off, which is radiation at the core of the planet. Because even our planet is a result of leftover gas clouds that was hovering around the sun before it formed itself. Right. So the sun plays a major role. This is the true most high for organisms that we can see visibly. Without it, we can't grow. Right. Um, talk to me about evolution. How do you suppose man evolved on the planet was we here before the ape was the ape here before us no 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 human beings human beings are we are i mean i know a lot of you probably don't agree with it either son that because you know we, we, we everybody has their, their views but i i deal with this you know i don't i don't know if, i don't know how you feel but human beings are a type of great ape we are not monkeys we are a type of great ape um, the, the, the gorilla is a great ape. The chimpanzee is a great ape. The bonobo chimp, is, which is a part of the chimpanzee family, subspecies of chimpanzee, and also the orangutan is great apes. And when you look at um, great apes don't have um, claws, they have nails. When you look at the rotating blade, when you look at the appendix, when you look at how the eye functions to receive light with um, human beings, chimpanzees, and, and, and gorillas, the way our receptors work through, through, the, through the iris, which is the color part of the eye, uh, the macula and the retina going all the way back to the visual cortex, which is right above the cerebellum, you can see. And we also all have cerebral cortexes, but it's, but theirs are not as complex as ours. But when you look at the appendix and different things, you know, monkeys have larger litters. Great apes don't. But that's, that's, that, that's, that, I don't want to go into specific detail of that, but we, we come from great apes, um, lesser great apes, um, that come out of, um, East Africa around, 20,000, 20, 20 million, this is 35, 30 million years ago, it split from a type of monkey, but that's before, way before we exist. So the common ancestor between the lesser, lesser, great, lesser great apes or lesser apes and the monkey have a common thread that split around 30 million to 25 million years ago. Then when you get into the different processes and different stages, they kept splitting around 8 million years ago. This is when you start to see the common gap between us and the chimp. But remember, the chimp is not a monkey. He's an ape, but he's not a monkey. We got to keep that going. Right. Then you see our species like Sahelopithecus become more bipedal. And looking at his spinal cord, the vertebrae, and looking at his feet, he becomes more bipedal. They call him Tomai. They found him in the Sahara. And then later on, from him, you give birth to the different specimens of, 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 of great apes that prepared for us, or predecessors that exist before us. Now... When you look at the oldest type of ape, when you find the one in Spain that goes back, I think, 11.5 million years, and his title was 11.9 million years. His name was Polo, Polo uh, let me get it, Pithecus. He goes back 11.9 million years. And his structure, his name, name Pyrolopithecus. Pyro I'll spell it out because I'm, I'm just off the top of my head. It's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's P-I-E-R-O-L-A-P-I-T-H-E-C-O-U-S. So when you're dealing with him, uh, Peter Olopithecus, when you deal with him, which goes back 11.9 million years, they found him in northeast, northeastern Spain. This creature was not, he exists before the 
um, orangutan, chimpanzee, and humans. But a little bit of his structure, looking at his femur bone and his wrist, shows that a lot of our earliest primate or great ape postures were like humans more than other types. Things were going backwards and forward. So when you deal with him, he wasn't a human. It's just certain postures of this, of this specimen of our earliest predecessor was more human-like, especially looking at his posture and looking at his femur bone, the hip, and, the, and, and, and also his wrist area, his hands. But he wasn't, he wasn't classified as a, uh, the other types of great apes of gorilla or orangutan yet. And this is a fossil that they found in northeastern Spain. And measuring in the fossil, it goes back 11.9 million years. But this wasn't a human. So human beings come out of the great ape family. We are a type of great ape. You know what I'm saying? When you look at the similarity between us and other great apes, you can see why we are a type of great ape. Are we orangutan? No, we're not. Are we a chimpanzee? No, we're not. We are homo sapiens sapiens, which has a common ancestor with these other great apes. Right, right. Powerful. Um, Minister Inky talked about the horizontal gene. Mm -hmm. What is the horizontal gene? What is that? Well, 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 when he talked about... Um, Horizontal, when he talked about horizontal, or turn my music down, when he talked about horizontal gene transference, it's not um, the kind, it's, it's actually something that's already out there. Um, well, how could I explain it? It's basically when genes transfer between organisms, you know what I'm saying, it, 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 in a manner of separate heredity. So gene transferred horizontally, horizontally is beneficial traits of organisms, you know, um, for example, um, it's when bacteria injects another bacteria and passes through plasmid, and that's a ring of DNA. So we do this all the time. You know, being around people on a bus, people breathing in and out different bacteria, this is going on all the time, if you understand horizontal gene transference. So it's, it's actually, a, a, it actually doesn't debunk evolution. You can use this within evolution. You have vertical gene transference as well, which works hands in hand. Talk to me about evolution psychology. What is what is that? What polite what polite mean when he say um what what did he say? Do you remember the statement he made? I mean, he was on point about um um the um, evolutionary psychology. I heard what he was saying, and it, right. it, it supports evolution. It's the, the the development of the brain and the functional behavior and the characteristics of the nervous system and how. Dendrites and synapse move, and the active processes of the brain development. It doesn't really go against it. And the most important thing for humans to make us so diverse, but uh, I'm not sorry, makes us different than other types of creatures or organisms in the animal kingdom is our cerebral cortex, or what scientists or neurologists refer to as gray matter. When you understand that, you can see the function and behavior and what makes us different. Human beings have the most complex cerebral cortex, the most complex. And you know, and what drew, and what drove humans is our imagination, is our imagination. So I mean, you know, what he was talking about explaining the process of evolutionary psychology, you can just look that up. It's a it's an actual science. You know what I'm saying? Evolutionary psychologist is an actual science, and it doesn't go against um, um, evolution. It's a approach of social and natural sciences. You know, it examines the psychological structure of cognitive thinking. That's what it does. Garden Eden is, is is allegorical bullshit. Right. Um, it's, it's it's not it's not it's not real. Um, the serpent, the serpent on an esoteric level, dealing with the the underlying principle of what these nomadic um, Bedouins was trying to write about. You know, um, the serpent represents you know neuroactivity. The brain represents. I mean, the tree represents the brain, and the vine was the thought that was activated. Eve, which means in Hebrew, Awa, which means change, or we get to, like for example. Um, um, the the Christmas Eve. This is longer the longest period of, of of night that we see. Awa, which means the evolution of man. Adam and Eve story itself is an explanation of the evolution that evolution of man. But I'm not going to give Hebrews that. This is coming from the house of wisdom because Hebrews really didn't understand a, a esoteric uh, science. All they wanted, all the real Hebrew wanted to do back then is just preserve their cattle. They were pastoralist nomads going from one area of the desert to the next. An Arab, an Arab, or modern day Arab. And I'm just being truthful. A modern-day Arab and a Hebrew is, is, is there no, it's no difference. I mean, the term Arab means to wonder. The term Hebrew means to cross over. So we're talking about Bedouins, a Bedouin-type people. The Greeks and the Persians put the esoteric twist to biblical, biblical text before they had a complete book. 
Let's be for real about it. So um, the Garden of Eden is, is, is allegorical. It's, it's not real in a literal sense. It's just an explanation like most myths. It's a myth, a, a story to, to make sense out of life. And it was a story to make sense out of life about the people that, that exist in that area, you know, near the Tigris and Euphrates or the Mesopotamia area. You get what I'm saying? Right. Right. Powerful, powerful, brother. Um... The people in ancient Kemet, was they on point? Did they deal with evolution? They and, dealt with evolution. And, 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 and hold up. Definition. And, 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 did yeah. they have an evolution today? Could you hear me? Yeah, hold up. What I was saying was, did they, the people of ancient Kemet, did they deal with evolution? And if so, then that right there proves the point that we've been dealing with this way before some damn Darwin. They stole our science, and what they did was corrupted it. Am I right or wrong, brother? Well, the, the, the ancient Egyptians talked about evolution with the deity Kepera, which means to evolve. In Greek, that goes back. Now, Kepera goes back 2,500 B.C. That's 4,500 years ago. The House of Wisdom with the Greeks goes back 332 B.C. The Greeks, remember, when the House of Wisdom came, this is when the Greeks tried to, again, translate. This is the Hellenized period when Greeks were translating a lot of the word, known world powerful literature, especially in Egypt, and made that the capital and made things what it is. So they talked about evolution. And you look up evolution in Greek, it means to roll, which is the same thing that you get with the dumb beetle. The Egyptians were very observative. They looked at the dumb beetle. They seen how it collects fecal matter and what comes out of it from smaller to larger. That goes to show the micro and the macro. We know that genome starts inside at micro and phenol starts outside. Basic biology teaches you that. So the thing is that, of course, the Egyptians had an idea of evolution. They understood. They didn't separate themselves from the kingdom. They told you that we come from the tears of Ra. Now, if you understand how life formed, shit, all living organisms come from stardust, dying stars. Why would they put that in there? Life comes out of dying stars. You get what I'm saying? And the Egyptians said we come from the tears of Ra. Well, when you look at the Agdog and the Ennead, you're dealing with, you know, the different stages of stellar evolution. But just not stellar evolution, but when you look at how smaller things, you know what I'm saying, becomes larger things. Or let's say the Agdog with Nu and Nunet, formlessness, and Ku and Kuket, you know what I'm saying, darknesses, and Hu and Huet, boundlessness. You're dealing with the quantum reality, quantum particles. You're talking about quarks, gluons, tactions, bosons, peons, muons. Or what we refer to as the Higgins, the Higgins, um, the Higgins, um, uh, the God, the God, um, Higgins boson field, if you want to call it that. You know, that's those are super subatomic particles. You get what I'm saying? And this boson is responsible for forming a field of matter. You get what I'm saying? So when you deal with the quantum reality, it makes way for the subatomic, which is proton, neutron, and electrons, which forms the atomic which is different elements that you see on the periodic table. The more, photon, the more protons you have on a periodic table, the heavier the element and the more they change. This is the whole process of Segmet, Pata, and Nephritim. Each element on that periodic table, which is 118 elements, is the different stages of Nephritim coming into brain, which is the beautiful blossom. Pata represents the attire or mass. So when you deal with the nucleus of an atom, you have the nucleus, you have the proton and the neutron, uh, the neutron and, the, and the electron, you have the nucleus. Nucleus that holds it together would be the great mother Segmet. This is Memphite theology. And the electron that's chasing it in between would be set or a pep. And Pata would be the attire. And the atomic structure outside of the shell or the shell of the atom is nephritim. It's made way by smaller particles. So those different elements of the periodic table that you see is Memphite theology, which is atum. Atum means the total, to complete. And all atomic structures represent him at whatever phase it is, symbolically speaking. You get what I'm saying? Right, I got you. I got you, brother. All right, now, moving on. Moving on. Let's go. Let's deal with melanin, brother. We got to get into melanin. What is melanin and how does it work? I want you to take your time, go in on it, and I'm not going to even stop you. Just give us the whole rundown. Well, you know, melanin is a complex polymer. It, it derives from amino acid called tyrosine. You know, it's responsible for determining in the color in your skin and your hair and, 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 and everything. Um, it's present in the skin varying in degrees, depending on what, what type. You have eumelanin, which is the highest level of darker pigmentation, depending on how much the population has, you know, exposed um, the sun. So melanin melanin is involved with uh, the steps involved in it is uh, biosynthesis of melanin. Uh, the first step is, you know, chemical L3-4, uh, the oxyhydrocholesterolin, 
which is uh, it's, it's it's transmitted through tyrosine. And the higher the, the higher the melanin content is, it's referred to as yule melanin. Theomelanin is red pigment. Yule melanin is dark pigment. So what we see what melanin really is is a chemical. <laughs> it's a natural chemical that evolved. You know what I'm saying? What time period did it evolve? Well, when you go back to our earliest ancestors, Australopithecine afarensis, or the different Australopithecines, they were something like intermediate brown. They had more fur on their body. Before, you know, things started happening, the forests dried up, and they had to develop more thicker sweat glances and, and reduce the hair and produce more darker spots on a higher dermis, which is called the epidermis. You have three dermises, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Hypodermis is the last stratum. In between, you have five, but you have three major dermises, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Hypodermis is when you get really, really, really deep at the third layer or whatever. But the way this melanin comes up, a lot of our early ancestors were two-toned, and once they start shedding their fur, it's like the bonobo. You know, the bonobo have black face and, and dark hands, but it's certain part of species. It also exists in hair and eye color. So it's always been around, but our species itself, once we start shedding fur and we can develop more darker pigment, goes back to the earliest stage of the first hominid, from astralop astral to earliest astralopithecines to Homo habilis, which goes back 2.5 million. And the more hair which we start shedding, the more we produce more yule melanin. Now, the thing about having a too much pigmentation or too much yule melanin in the skin, it's harder for us to synthesize vitamin D. That's why darker skinned people have to sit in the sun longer. People that develop more lighter pigment or the, or the reddish undertone, I don't want to say field melanin or what they refer to as spurs because most women have this yellowish or reddish undertone anyway, even if they're dark. If you look up field melanin and yule melanin, you'll see that. But the spur, spurs, people that develop the lighter pigment, they had to develop lighter pigment, pigment living in the farther northern latitude because it would have been beneficial to them. You get what I'm saying? So they develop more lighter pigment. They didn't develop the pale skin. The pale skin is something that comes recent. Now, we're talking about the earliest type of Europeans that goes back 24,000 years. If we talk about the earliest people that was found in Cro-Magnum Cave in France, they wasn't white. They wasn't white. They were intermediate brown and olive. I give them Alicia Keys color. If we're dealing with dermatology, we can deal with the evolutionary process of skin. Now, the earliest ones or the lightest skin a person was at this time was probably like Alicia Keys or Obama color. That's the lightest compared to the other people that stayed in the equatorial zones of the continent that was dark. Later on, as time went by, they hadn't developed this lighter, this lighter pigment in order to synthesize vitamin D. Now, we know in nature, if you don't lose it, you lose it. So there's no need to having all this pigmentation, you get what I'm saying, and all this dark pigment living in a level of, of latitude of sunlight, which is not UVB, but UVA, the zone that they were in. UV ultraviolet aging rays, that texture of sunlight was too weak to synthesize in the blacks vitamin D. So they had to develop lighter pigmentation. And the lightest that they got back then, it wasn't pale skin yet because that comes later on down the line. Pale skin comes around 6,000 to 12,000 years ago. And this mutation was a depletion of the 111 amino acid, which called SLC24A5 or SLC45A2. And they met, and they seen that through the testing of zebrafish. This is a recent mutation. So the earliest Europeans wasn't even albinos. That's a myth, too, because SLC24A5 is another mutation outside of albinism. You can have OCA1 trait, and, you, and a girl can have OCA1 trait that you reproduce with, and once those traits come together, you can form an albino child. Just like two people have sickle cell trait. They can form a child with full-blown sickle cell. So these traits exist in people when it comes to albinism. But this depletion to the 111 amino acid is something totally different, which causes the pellet skin. So melanin, back to the term melanin, melanin itself is just a chemical. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. that we develop in equatorial zones right so to help um, so to help since i'm sorry yeah the rocks the trees that also have melanin in it all of it all of it has me all of it the darker you see you can look at um gregor mendel he shows you that with plants you know the bolder the plant is or the stronger the plant is the more dark it is the more dark and bolder it is the more dominant it is in that sense yeah. everything has the melanin melanin always been around it's a natural chemical right okay um the European says melanin don't mean nothing. We don't melanin is nothing. You know that's that's their science because they don't understand they don't say it. Because oh. now they understand the importance of melanin. It's a good science is called Nina Jablaski, yeah. and she complete she breaks down the importance of having melanin and how melanin helps protect us from the ultraviolet rays. If melanin didn't mean nothing, they would need to use titanium in their sunscreen to help protect them from ultraviolet rays because it's harmful for them because they're more prone to catching melanoma. You get what I'm saying? Right, right. 
So they, it, 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 they, they understand that melanin is very important, especially living in places where ultraviolet burning rays or UVB rays stand out the most. It's very important. But having a, was a lot of melanin living in Arctic areas where no humans should be living, it's not beneficial for you because it's hard. It's already hard for you to synthesize vitamin D because of all the melanin you have. You have melanin is put in play to help protect you from the ultraviolet burning rays. But in between, it also blocks the levels of vitamin D that you get, so it's harder for you to synthesize it. So you have to stay in the sunlight longer than you know than than other people. You know what I'm saying? Now with Europeans, they have um um uh, they they it's easy for them to synthesize vitamin D. But they have a lot of neural tube effects because of the increasing of of, 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 of of what we refer to as folate. They have a lot of neural tube defects. This is why they have a lot of reproductive area, uh, reproduction problems and fertile clinic. It's harder for them to reproduce. You know what I'm saying? Now, when when Africans don't get the proper vitamin D, we catch bone disorders. Our children can be born with rickets. And it also uh, affects how we reproduce. But if that's if we're not getting the proper vitamin D. See, they can get the proper vitamin D, but their folate is fucked up. Right. Powerful, brother. Powerful. Um, let me ask you this here. At one point, the European was not on the planet. Mm -hmm. How did the European evolve? How did he get here on the planet? Well, he, he came from a group of, of, of a group of people that left out of the continent of Africa. Um, they left out of Africa around 60,000 years ago. It's looking at the human genome, especially the mitochondria, the blue science is referred to as mitochondrial E. You can see through mitochondrial L3, it gave birth to M and N, and from M and N, it gave birth to ROPS and H and um, and um, different types of subclass branches of the genome on the mitochondrial side, which is the powerhouse of the cell. But we don't have to use that. If we look at haplogroup CTM168 and we follow a phylogenetic tree of the pattern, you can see what happened and what direction these humans went in. The last haplogroup on the paternal side that formed was R1B, which would most Europeans have, R1B, M269, or different subclass branches. That's on the human genome side. But they left out of Africa. They go into the Middle East. Some of these people in the Middle East breed with archaic humans like Neanderthal forming hybrids. The first set of hybrids that they formed was sterile because two different subspecies, Homo sapiens sapiens and Neanderthal, wasn't the same. So when you look, it's just like a liger. A lion and a tiger is two different subspecies. Male ligers are sterile. They can't reproduce. So when you look at the first, it's articles, and I can post it whenever you ask me to. The first hybrids between Homo sapiens sapiens and Neanderthal, those males were sterile. The only ones that can carry it was the hybrids between them, hybrid woman in modern humans so more humans due to a lack of i don't know what was going on people might say well couldn't they just turn back around and go back to africa it ain't that easy i mean this is like if i if my car broke down and i got lost in on the expressway all the way in missouri and i couldn't get a ride it ain't gonna be that easy for me to go back you know what i'm saying some people just was going outside of the continent just following the routes and they couldn't find their way back they had generations of children in certain areas people kept moving you know what I'm saying? And we don't understand if it was a shortage on women. They say, well, why would they have sex with something like that for them to reproduce with Neanderthal? Well, it's just like if you ask a man in jail who haven't been around a woman for a long time and a fat Cook County Sheriff European woman want to give him some, you dig, what are you going to do? And he ain't been around a woman for a long time. What are you going to do? Right, right. So what I'm saying is we don't know what was going on with the climate the different changes that was going on in the climate for these humans to breed with them. And we know it's a fact because when they look at people outside of Africa, DNA, or they go into the human leukoantigens, which and they look at the HLAs, the human leukoantigens, they see that these people outside of Africa bred with archaic humans like Neanderthal and Dina Sylvan, but it's not an overall. They just show it inside, somewhere down within the human leukoantigen. You can see that, especially at the demi level of DNA, and not the clans, at the demi level, that two to five percent stands out in stronger areas. Like for example, Europeans have a lot higher level of creatine in their skin to deal with colder climate than me and you. You get what I'm saying? Also, when you look at the, 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 the they're, they're also more prone to diabetes, chain smoking, and different types of disorders that they got from their Neanderthal ancestors. But they're not overall that subspecies. You just see the higher range of it inside of them within the human leukoantigens, HLAs. Yes. Um, so, so what they are is hybrid mutants. Because later on, around 12 to 6,000 years ago, they developed a mutation because of the depletion of the 111 amino acid. SLC two four eight five, and that caused them to have pale skin. And it caught a mutation OCA two oxyacetinia strand two, which is the second strand of albinism near the Georgia area, or the Caucasus, where they develop blue eyes. 
OCA2, that gene is only 10,000 years old. You can look that up. When did blue eyes, when did the blue eyes form? It only goes back 10,000 years. So these people represent a downgrade of humanity. These are the people that went outside of their zone and completely lost certain qualities about themselves and mutated. So would it be fair to say that they devolved? I'm not going to say that they devolved because they're, they're the same species. They just developed certain traits that was beneficial to them in poor areas where humans shouldn't be living. And those genes that was able to survive developed certain qualities about their cells where they had to survive. And they were capable of surviving by reducing certain things. So they lost certain qualities about their cells because it wasn't needed in those areas. That's why Africans should live in, in, in colder environments for twelve or 14,000 years. It's not beneficial. Right. You know, I asked... I asked Dr. Ali Muhammad the same question yesterday, and um, I asked him how did white people got here, and and I ran down the same thing. I, I told him I gave him Sheikh Anta Diop's theory, and I told him mm -hmm. Sheikh Anta Diop said that the African migrated and walked all the way across and went over into Europe, mm -hmm. and when he got into Europe, he stayed there through, through a period of time through the ice ages and all of that. And he mm -hmm. got stuck over there, and, and he changed through the adaptation. Well, Ali said no. He didn't agree with that. He said the white man straight up and down comes from the monkey. <laughs> well, you got to ask Ali the question. Human beings can't reproduce with a monkey or a chimpanzee because that 2% difference in the chromosome won't allow us to. That 2% difference make, is a big gap. It won't allow you to. You can't create that type of hybrid. That motherfucker won't last a day. But Barack Obama's not sterile. He can reproduce, and he's he's bi, he's what we call biracial, whatever the hell that is. Uh, Alicia Keys, she's not sterile. She can carry children. If you're able to breed with these people and reproduce with them, how are they something different? How are they a different species? How do they come from monkeys? And I don't want to hit an RH factor thing, because we broke down erythroblastosis plenty of times, and we looked at it, where it came from and what happened. The majority of the people on the planet are RH positive. The less people with RH negative that reproduce with a person with RH positive, a male, that blood attacks that baby, and when that blood attacks the baby, the baby can die because of the chemical reaction or chemical disorder called erythroblastosis. But now all they got to do is give you a de shot, and you can, you can live off that. That's rare. So that's bull crap. Um... The question is, why is it are we, why is it that we are able to reproduce with these people, and you can't reproduce with a gorilla or a chimp? The, the gene won't allow you to. It won't allow you to. So no, they are not coming from monkeys. And white people don't even come from Europe directly. The original first white people, the mutation of SLC two four eight five or four five eight two, developed in Central Asia before going into Europe. They just found the fossil that goes back seven thousand years in Spain, and the damn dude with dark skin with blue eyes. Now I don't know how dark he was, but look up dark skin fossil of European seven thousand years. People in Europe wasn't pale skin. That mutation of the depletion of the hundred eleven amino acids starts in Central Asia somewhat toward Kazakhstan or Kazakhstan or what we refer to as Turkey in that area where that mutation came and they, those, but it wasn't the Afro-Asiatic that Akkadian and Semitic comes out of. The Stratic speakers was already over there and they formed agriculture around in the Levant area. It was already in Africa 24,000 years, but it goes in the Levant area around 15,000 with the Natufians. It becomes massive at around 12,000. And then later on, they get with the Indo-European speakers near Turkey, Proto-Indo-European speakers before Indo-European was an established language, because that only goes back 4,500 years. And they give them agriculture. So now we have to find out who brought the pale skin gene into Europe. Because the earliest Europeans wasn't pale. Like I said, the earliest Europeans was Alicia Keys color, before this pale skin even exists. Before that, you had paler skin in Neanderthals because it happened more than one time. But they wasn't, it wasn't because of the, the shit that you see that's going on. How light and how dark was it? That's why it's important to study dermatology and understand how skin works. So people left out of the Middle East before going into Europe. The earliest human making in the Europe 35,000 years ago. They didn't even survive. And before that, the Cro-Magnum, when the Cro-Magnum cave made it that 24,000 years ago. This is the Gregor, um, Grendel, um, Gregor, um, Gregor Mendel glacier period. And then later on, other people started going down. And farming makes it into, into Europe around 8,000 years ago. So you're dealing with mutated Africans, because Homo sapiens sapiens, or the species that humans are, is an African species that will be developed there. Mm -hmm. When you hear, when you hear the words evolution, conference, would you say now that that should be a good conference? Because now 
we up in the ante. We, we want to see where's the real scientists at in the community. Do you think that that would be a good conference? I think the Evolutionary Conference is a great conference because we want to see what's important and what's not important. We want to see, we, 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 I think it should be an evolutionary creationist conference. But some people are saying that they're not dealing with creation and they're dealing with something else. Uh, according to Minister Inky, the brother said that creationism ism is wrong and evolution is wrong. He deal with horizontal gene transference. I think I, I think I think Muhammad said that some some something else. He said that both of them was wrong. So I think that the evolutionary conference is important because you have people that's trying to pose or dissect it to show where it's wrong and where it's not wrong. You know. So I think it. I think it. I think it is out there because now we're putting everything on the table. But while we're putting everything on the table, we can't use, um, you can't combat evolution if you don't have a scientific model or a scientific explanation to prove what you're saying. Because what I'm hearing mostly is philosophy. People are saying what they believe or what they think, their idea of how things come. But when you start putting stuff on the table, showing the tools that scientists use and the methodologies that they use to measure and, 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 and just looking at transcendental, um, transcendental fossils and different things and showing proof with the scientific explanation of model, they just come with philosophy. And one of the things they like to run with to say that the fossils was false is the pit down man. But we know put down man was proven false. And we're going to show and prove it. Yes, yes the put down man was false, but the other types of hominids wasn't. So we, we want to hear what they, what, they, what they got to, you know, what they're saying. And I think what you're doing is, is very important because it's putting everything on the table. But what they need to do while they're putting things on the table is show the scientific uh, model, show where it, it has been stumped, stamped or approved, and show, and show and prove how it becomes what it is. Because we can show how it becomes what it is. You're just talking philosophy or metaphysical stuff. Right, 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 right. Okay, my brother. Um, that's it for me. I ran out of questions.